Uh, wishing I you well. see. I see. Uh, Thank okay, you so, so much. Of course. So, so chapter four um, is really deepening. And if a couple of weeks ago, we gave a nice introduction to chapter four that explains the deeper part of Teshuva. Till now, to the first three chapters was really getting into the basics of Teshuva. How deep as we went is really just covering the basics of what is Teshuva, what is not Teshuva, uh, what is atonement, and what is the gift that's beyond the atonement. And that's where we got into fasting and is fast, fasting for our generation or not. But the, the, the remaining chapters from chapter four gets into the Kabbalah of Teshuva. The Kabbalah of Teshuva means, besides for what's happening in your soul, through a sin and obviously through the teshuva and the correction, what is happening on high? When a person does a sin, God forbid, um, there's also a deeper um, uh, reparation that needs to happen from the uh, fragmentation that's being caused in God's name. So according to the Zohar, and I, I wrote this out on the screen a couple of weeks ago, uh, we have what's known as the Hebrew word teshuva could be broken up into two words. Teshuva has a hey at the end, and tashuv, which is the first three quarters of the word teshuva, tashuv means to return. So tashuv hey, which is breaking up the word teshuva into two words, it literally would mean returning the hey. So we explain that in the in God's name, which is made up, it's known as the Tetragrammaton, it's made up of four Hebrew letters, a Yud, a He, a Vav, and a He. We actually don't, we're forbidden from even pronouncing it um, uh, until Mashiach comes back in the temple. But during our, our time of exile, we don't even pronounce God's, I think it's known as the ineffable name. We don't even pronounce it. Um, but in that name of God, which is comprised of a Yud, a He, a Vav, and a He, there's two He's. The, the second letter is a hey, and the fourth letter, the last letter is a hey. So tashuv hey, which means to return the hey, is referring to the two hey's of God's name, that our job is to return the hey back into its name. Because when we do a sin, we're separating the hey from God's name. And in fact, there could be two separations, the lower hey of God's name, the last hey, and the second letter, the higher hey of God's name. So therefore, there's actually two levels of teshuva. There's a lower level of teshuva, and then there's also going to be a higher level of teshuva. The lower returning, meaning the, the returning of the lower hay, and the returning of the higher hay. Um, so in order to explain this, we went into explaining how in olden the olden days, there were a punishment that a person would pass away by the age of sixty. The quite famous example that he, that Alter Rebbe brings in parentheses is from the great Judah, not the Maccabee, but Judah, the son of Jacob, which is where our name as Jews, Jewish people, come from. The word Judah, that's where we come from, from the tribe of Judah, um, and really Messiah comes from that tribe. But it says before. Um, um, uh, before the, the 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 seed of Mashiach was born to Judah, he had other sons. One of their names were Er, and one of their names were Onan, and they both died premature. They both died young, and it was for certain sins that they were doing that uh, cut them off at a younger age. But the Al Rebbe asks quite a famous question. We see that people that have committed certain sins that they would be punished with this, we see that they're living happy lives. We see that they're not being punished. So um, the question over here we ended with section one with was, how do we understand that in place of death through the agency of heaven, a person would live a long and happy life? So in order to explain that, we went into first explain um, the root of our soul, the soul's root, which is taken from uh, the from God's name. And let's just explain that a little bit. Uh, we explained that God breathed into us a breath of life. And there's a big difference between a breath of a person that is from breathing, that's from a much deeper place, to speech of a person that's from an external place. And therefore, a person could speak a lot before having to take a breath, whereas if a person is, is blowing, they could only blow a short amount of time before they get exhausted. 
Because when God created the world, he created the world with speech. Uh, but when God created the neshama, the soul, he created it from his breath. And just to highlight um, on page 65, a practical lesson we had on that was there is a radical difference between the divine energy invested in your soul and the divine energy invested in the rest of the universe. The energy in your soul is from deep within God, which is his breath. The energy in the rest of the universe is relatively superficial, which is like speech. Um, so it's more of a, the the, uh, the breath or the neshama is coming from a much deeper uh, part. And then it, it continues its journey down. Um, and let's just read one more uh, thought on 67 at the bottom. Our sages said that each and every soul was in the presence of his divine majesty before coming down to this earth, and that the souls are hewn from under the seat of glory. These sayings emphasize the essential nature of the soul, its holiness and purity, and its being completely divorced from anything material and physical. The soul itself, by its very nature, is not subject to any material desires or temptations, uh, which is beautiful. And that was from the Rebbe in a letter from 1954. Um, okay, so let's continue now in section three, which is going to be on page 68. We explain the difference that even angels are coming from the speech of God. And um, souls are coming from a much deeper place, which is from God's name um, of Havaya, of Yud, He, Vav, and He. So what we're going to now be explaining is having understood that our soul is deeply rooted and it comes from the breath of God. Um, and it's coming from the name of God, meaning our, our soul is comprised of God's holy name. God's name of yud Hey vav and Hey is the root of our soul. So now in section three, we're, three, we're going to explain an incredible idea explaining the root of our soul based in the, in the name of God. So section three, if you're looking in the book, it's going to be on the bottom of 68. If you're looking in the Kindle, I will share the screen right now. Okay, it's called, the title of this chapter of this section is called the Tetragrammaton. In section three, the Tanya explained how the soul in its root is connected with the sacred Tetragrammaton. Assuming that's a mistake, and I probably should have said section two, because that was a previous section. I'm assuming that's a typo. But... Okay, so I think there's a few typos in the next couple pages, but yeah, does that, does, does, Vivian and Shira, what does it say in your book? It also says in section three? Yeah, it should be section two. Okay, turn two more pages. Um, what section do you have next on page 75? 75. Does it say section three again? At the bottom? Well, it actually says in section two. Right, what the title? What does the title say? Section, section three. three. Section three again. All right, so there's a couple titles, but it's fine. Yeah. Um, in section two, the Tanya explained how the soul in its root is connected with the sacred tetragrammaton. In this section, we will decode the meaning of the four letters of the tetragrammaton. So this is a really deep Kabbalistic idea where we're going to go into the name of God, which is the Yud, the He, the Vav, and the He, and decode it. So let's explore the matter further. We are familiar with Elijah's teaching in Tikkun Zohar. It is you who produce ten adornments. We call them the ten sephiros to conduct hidden worlds. So this is a direct quote from the Zohar. And Elijah is the one that is teaching this in the Zohar. And it's called um, Patach Eliyahu. It's a very famous section of the Zohar that actually traditionally we read this section on Friday evening, right before Shabbat. It's called Patach Eliyahu. In fact, there's the Sephardic Siddur of different versions of the Siddur, it's called a Nusa. There's different Nusa'ot or different um, um, versions of this of, of, of the Siddur. The Sephardic Siddur, the Sephardic Nusa, is known as Patach Eliyahu. That's the name of their Siddur, named for this section of the Zohar. So it's a very famous section of the Zohar. And it says like this, 
It is you, meaning God, who produced ten adornments, and we call them the ten sifirot, to conduct hidden worlds. You are wise, but not with a known wisdom. You will understand, which is Bina, but not with a known understanding of Bina. This is a primary source text for the ten sefiras, or energies, which constitute the divine realm. The ten sefiras are Sachma, which is inquiry, Bina, which is cognition, Das, which is recognition, Chesed, which is love and kindness and giving, Devura, which is power, judgment, discipline, and fear. Tiferes, which is beauty, compassion, harmony, exactly very good, harmony and truth. Netzach, which is endurance. Hod, which is splendor and gratitude. Yisod, which is connection. And Malchus, which is control and manifestation. Sometimes the list of ten sefiros also includes the transcendent energy of Keser, which is the crown or the willpower, in which case Das is excluded from the list. So we'll pause here. So I, I just want to, I'm, I'm going to keep the screen up um, uh, just because I want everyone to see that a few times. But um, throughout Tanya, already from chapter three of the first book of Tanya, this was something that the Alter Rebbe mentioned. And that it's, it's rare for us to see the full 10 listed out um, which and and um, as Shira was just saying, this is an appropriate time to go through them because during the seven weeks between Passover and Shavuot, we count what's known as the Omer, and during the Omer counting, we go through the seven emotional um, uh, connect uh, emotional attributes or emotional uh, feelings that we have. So the seven are the last seven, starting with Chesed, which I'll highlight over here. From here, you have seven, and that's really what we focus on during the time of the Sephira. Right now, we're focusing on the um, attribute of Tiferis, which is compassion, beauty, truth, and uh, harmony. Tiferis, Shabbat, Yeah, very good. Or Chesed, Shabbat, Tiferis, exactly. Yes. And then there's also three cognitive ones, which are the three top ones, which is Chachma, Bina, and Das, uh, which we, we have been studying more about those throughout Tanya. Um, which the acronym of those three is Chabad, right? Chachma bin Andas, inquiry, cognition, and recognition is um, the acronym of Chabad. <clears throat> anyway, the point over here is when it says you are wise, but not with a known wisdom, we, as the people, we also have wisdom. We also have kindness. But it's not, even though it's mirroring God's kindness, it's not the same kindness. It's not the same wisdom. So God's sefiras have that wisdom, but it's different than the wisdom that we have. Um, just a parenthetical, we just had a lot of our family in town for, for bar mitzvah. Uh, my niece, my uh, Adina's sister's uh, daughter, uh, who's the same age of, of, of our Betsy, they're one and a half, her name is Sephira Eli, which means the vessel. Eli is the Hebrew word for a vessel. And sefira is these attributes. They're known as sefira, which is the 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 godly lights of God, and that's what they named their daughter, which is beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so the sefiras are not creations separate from God, but rather emanations or energies that remain bound with His absolute oneness, like a flame in a burning coal. So that's a beautiful, important line. They're not creations of God but they're energies that are always bound with God. Let's see the practical lessons. I don't think there's any, there's nothing there that's different than what we just read in the text, but I guess just to make sure we read it, we'll read it anyway. Practical lessons, the 10 fundamental divine energies, are sefiras are chachma, inquiry, bina, cognition, das, recognition, chesed, which is love, kindness, and giving, divura, which is power, judgment, discipline, and fear, Tiferes, which is beauty, compassion, harmony, and truth. Netzach, which is endurance. Hod, which is splendor and gratitude. Yesod, which is connection. And Malchus, which is control, manifestation. Was Yaakov um, synonymous with Tiferes? Yes. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were known to be the top three emotive attributes, which is Tesseg, Gvur, and Tiferes. 
Joseph was known to be the level of your sowed, which is connection. Uh, we could spend a whole class just focusing on these, you know, 10 or really even just seven. But if I were to ask you, if you were to choose, um, you know, the, you know, pick, pick the top three. <laughs> or even if, even if, to make it easier, leave, leave two out. Like if you were able to drop two of them, which ones would you drop? And, you know, Hasidus and Kabbalah are filled with the importance of each one of the sephiras. That you need to have a balance. That if you have chesed, love and kindness, without a balance of power, judgment, discipline, and fear, you actually will have a chaotic world. You won't be able to have a livable world if people have just love and not discipline. Just like a teacher can't teach if he's only going to be kind and not have discipline. Um, you know, hode, which is gratitude. If you don't have gratitude, you're not going to be able to um, uh, um, uh, get far in life. If you don't have endurance, you're not going to be able to succeed. So really, each one is like so perfect, the balance of all of them. Now, of course, depending on your soul, some of us have more than one than others. And that's why cer there's certain people that are more passionate and empathetic than others. But in truth, we all have, we can pry our soul power, prizes of all 10, just some of us have more of one than another. So some of us have more humility, or some people have better communication skills, because they have more you so they have more, um, they emphasize more on the connection part. But um, um, all of them are, I would say, equally important, or they all branch off from the same sources that we need all of them. Um, okay, so let's continue inside. All the ten sephiros are represented in the letters of the name Havaya. So this is what really we're going to be emphasizing, not so much on the sephiros themselves, but how the ten sephiros actually come from the four letters of God's name. And they are also hinted, too, by the shapes of the letters. The four-letter tetragrammaton contains the ten sephiros in code. As we shall see, the ten sephiros are even encoded in the shape of the letters. How are the 10 energies represented by just four letters? The Tanya will devote the rest of the section to explaining the code in detail. So we're going to be cracking the code together. The sephiras are found both in the divine realm and in the human soul. Through identifying the human experience associated, associated with each of the sephiras, we can begin to imagine how that energy manifests in the divine realm. So this parenthesis is quite important. There's sephiras the way they are by God. God has the emotive, the emotion of kindness. God has the emotion of compassion, of discipline. And so do we. So we're going to identify how, in the four letters of God's name, we can experience those 10 um, sephiras. And by us seeing it, how it plays out in our human soul, those Ben Sephiros, within the four letters of God's name, we'll see, at least be able to imagine how it also manifests in by, by Hashem, in the divine realm. Okay, the first letter of the Tetragrammaton, which is the Yud, which typographically is just a small point. That hints to God's Chachma, which begins in a totally concealed state and then diffuses outwards to power the intellectual process. So the Yud, the way it's written in the Torah, is more or less just, it's the smallest letter. It's just a dot. It's a point. And from there, you expand. Um, um, uh, from there, it expands. So the Yud is refer representing the Chachma, which is the, the wisdom or the inquiry, to be able to take something that's concealed and then bring it outward. As we discussed in chapter in part one, chapter three. So this is all the way at the beginning of the Tanya. Bachma is the beginning of the intellectual process, the moment when an inspirational idea or concept pops into your head. It is the initial experience of thought, which is undeveloped. In the divine realm, it corresponds to the first emergence of energy, which powers everything that follows. And it is and is represented by the first letter 
of the tetragrammaton. The form of that letter, the yud, is a relatively shapeless point hinting to the undeveloped nature of Chachma. It's just a point. It's undeveloped. It's just an idea that needs to still be developed and expanded on. Chachma is a bridge between formlessness and form. The energies below Chachma, so there's nine energies below Chachma, those have distinct forms, far more than a simple point. The energies above Chachma have no form at all. I cannot be represented typographically. Chachma sits in the middle. It is the initial emergence of form, but undeveloped. It is just a dot. So you have the energies under Chachma, which are already have a form. You have energies above Chachma, which can't have a form. Chachma is that in-between or bridge between formlessness and form, between... Um, yeah, it's still it's it's being it's not yet developed, but it's already emerging. Let's see if in the book. All right, so both in the book and on page seventy and in the Kindle page on the screen, you will see the shape of the letter. Um, to be able to see it on the screen, and the thorn above the yud hints to the divine will or keser, which utterly transcends super supernal chachma, as is known from Zohar. Okay, so just to expand on this a little bit, so we have the yud. It's a, it's a really a zoomed in yud, and uh, Vivian and Cher, you see the yud on on page seventy. Yes. yes. So you have the yud, which is you know this is zoomed in, but this is a dot. So that's referring to the emerging of an idea of an inspiration that is not yet developed. It's just an idea that has to be expanded on. Now, the yud also has a little point at the top of it. It's like the thorn above it. That's actually how it's written in the Torah. So that is referring to what's above the Chachma. You have the, you have the Chachma, which is the inquiry state of what's above. And then already there, you, you see the point that is transcending Chachma. And that is known as the divine will. In Hebrew, it's known as the crown, Eser, or Kater. When drawn scribally, like when a, a scribe draws it, the Yud is not a completely shapeless dot contains a thorn-like protrusion. Unlike the main body of the Yud, which, while small, does manage to spread itself across a certain space, the thorn is tiny and thin, merely points to something else. It is as if the thorn is saying, what I represent is too subtle to be depicted visually by a letter. So I am just pointing to something outside and beyond. The thorn of the Yud which points upwards, alludes to the transcendent quality of will, which drives all of our activities, mental, emotional, and practical, and yet cannot be associated with a, third, with a, with a certain organ place in our bodies. In the divine realm, the thorn of the yud represents the formless energies which transcend chachma. So I just want to explain this, uh, expand on this just a little bit. In, according to Kabbalah, each of the ten sefirot, or divine energies, are are connected with a certain body part. So, for example, Chachma is obviously connected with the head, with the mind. Um, Chesed is re represented by the right side of our of our of our our, our right arm, because this idea of giving. Devura is represented by our left arm. Netzach and hod, endurance and and, um, and gratitude are represented by the two thighs, the two legs, and malchut, which is the, the lowest, is actually connected with the ability of speech, um, and that's how God created the world with that malchus ability, which is bringing it out towards something else, which is what we do with our speech. So what we're saying here is, while the ten sefirot are connected with an organ, we're connected with a body part. Heser, which is the will, is beyond any specific body part. It's what remains above. So if you look at the Yud, it has that little point on the top. It's almost like pointing to something that's above, that can be um, uh, brought into an actual point, into, into something visually. It's pointing to something that's beyond, pointing upwards to something that transcends. 
Um, and when it, while it transcends, it actually is the root. It drives all of our activities, whether it's the, mo- the mental, which is the, the top three of Sachma Bin Andas, or the emotional, which is the seven emotive ones, or the practical, all of it is driven by the willpower, by the will. So we have the Kesser, which is the crown, which ri- which uh, which is above, and it's not even in, um, it's not any of the four letters of God's name, but it's it's alluded to by the thorn above the letter Yud. So the Yud is representing Chachma, because the Yud is the smallest of of Hebrew letters, and it's re- rep- it's referring to the inquiry state where things are still undeveloped. It's just a point, but it's undeveloped. It's a form because it's not formless like the way it is above the Yud, above Chachma, but it's still just a, a point and it's not fully developed and formed yet. But then you also have what's above it and that's represented by the thorn of the Yud that's pointing to something that's even beyond it. All right, so afterwards, when Chachma diffuses further and is disclosed within the mental process of Bina in the hidden world, it is represented by the second letter of the Tetragrammaton, which is the hate and hinted to by its shape. So the hay is a very expanded letter, unlike the yud, which is just a point. The hay is a very wide letter, and it's re- representing that the stage after chachma, which is inquiry, is a stage of cognition, understanding, developing, analyzing, and expanding an idea that just came into your mind. So that's hinted to in the shape of the hay, which is expanded. Hey hints to Bina, since typographically the letter fills the full width of the font, representing and hinting to the outward expression of a concept as it becomes clarified and understood. The hey also fills the full letter height of the font, hinting to the downward flow of energy, filling the hidden worlds of Sachma and Bina. So there's an outward expression, which is the wide part of the hey. There's also a downward energy flow, which is the height of the hay that's from above to below. Um, so since Chachma is a mere point or flash of intellect, it seeks articulation, which in- requires assistance from a completely different energy. The faculty of Bina, which is cognition, is represented by the second letter of the Tetragrammaton, which is the hay. Spatially, the hay has everything the Yud lacks. It is fully formed in both dimensions of width and height, indicative of the cognitive ability uh, to flesh out a raw idea and explore all its possible ramifications, rationally and, ad- and objectively. In the divine realm, the height and width of the hay represents the full development of forms within Bina. So Bina absorbs the spark of Chachma, shapes it, and refines it. It systemizes, organizes, and it characterizes focusing entirely on the parts rather than the whole. So if you take just an example in business, you could have the innovator, which is the person that comes up with incredible ideas, and yet they could be extremely unsuccessful because while they have incredible ideas, they have no way to implement it. Their personality is more just creativity. But a successful business is when you have the creative Team. And then you have the business-minded team, which is more the people that are taking the idea that was given to them, and now they're implementing it. They're taking something raw and exploring it. And they need the ball. Oh, right. And that's going to come next. Yeah. But the hay is the idea of expanding an idea of, uh, what, of, of that was just so raw. But a lot of times the hay type of person doesn't have the inquiry ability, which is the creativity or ideas, they're lacking the idea. So a good team is when you have the creative, right, connecting with the um, the um, um, Bina type, with the people that are able to analyze the idea and um, and take it and bring it to a form or develop it into something that that is um, understandable. So I love that last line. It shapes the Chachma. It refines it. It organizes, characterizes it. Okay, that's awesome. So subsequently, then, as Shira was just saying, you need a Vav. You need to be able to bring it out from the hidden 
to the reveal. You have to actually now do the marketing. You have to actually take it to the next level, which is to bring it out in a practical place. When this flow reaches further downwards to the revealed worlds, like the stage, for example, where a person wants to disclose his idea uh, verbally to somebody else. I don't know. Oh, so this is like the next stage when he wants to actually um, uh, communicate it. He wants to reveal something to, to another person. This stage is represented by the last two letters of the Tetragrammaton, the Vav and the He, and hinted by their shape. So we went through the Yud, we went through the He, now we're going to go through the last two letters, which is going to be the Vav and, and the last He. The four letters of the Tetragrammaton are divided into two groups. The first two letters, which is the Yud and the He, have a mental energy and are described as hidden worlds, like your thoughts that are hidden from other people. So again, the idea of mental energy is because it's all within your mind. The Yud is the idea that you have, and the He is understanding the idea, developing it into your mind to make it make sense. So that's all within you. So it's it's still hidden. Then the last two letters... Uh, let's go back inside. The last two letters, the Vav and the He, have an emotional energy, which is revealed like your emotions, which express your feelings. In the hidden worlds, divine energies are nurtured and formed in potential. That is why Bina is compared to a divine womb, in which energies grow and gestate before they are disclosed. Once they emerge from Bina, the energies shift to the second two letters of the Tetragrammaton, which represent revealed worlds. So you have the hidden world, which is Rachma and Bina. And when they come out of the womb, they're almost like being born over here. Um, it shifts to revealed. And this is, all this is, of course, relatively speaking. These are still energies within the divine realm before they are disclosed to the universe. The Tanya decodes the significance of the last two letters. Since the Vav, which is a vertical line, which resembles a downward arrow, represents the flow downwards from the hidden world, which is the Yod and the He, into the revealed worlds. And this flow is also powered by God's emotional attribute of chesed, which is benevolence and goodness, and his other five holy emotional attributes, which are all included in the general category of the Vav, whose numerical value is six. So, this is all just such a beautiful idea. The shape of the vav is a line from up to down. And, in, and if I'm not mistaken, we just had a scribe here a couple... When did we have a scribe here? Vivian, you were here, right? Not too long ago, yeah. Were you here, Shira, for the scribe? No, but I knew about it. Yeah, it was in March. I think like two months ago, we had a, a, a lovely scribe. He's a friend of mine. And I'm pretty sure, I don't think he mentioned it at the class, but I'm pretty sure a scribe, when they write the letter vav, it has to start from the top, and they have to make their way down. They're not allowed to start from the bottom and make their way up, I'm pretty sure. But either way, the idea of the Vav is the flow of energy from what's higher to what's lower, from what's hidden, what's in the mind, to now being expressed and revealed. And in fact, the, the letter Vav, besides for the shape representing this idea, the letter Vav also has a number, right? The Aleph equals one, the Bet would equal two, the Gimel would equal three, the Dalit would equal four. The He would equal five. And then you have the Vav, which would equal six. So this is representing the six emotions that are from Chesed, which is kindness, and Gevura, which is uh, judgment or discipline and fear. Then you have Teferis, which is harmony, unity, and compassion. Then you would have Netzach, which is endurance. You would have Hod, which is known as splendor or gratitude. And then you would have Yesod, which is connection. So those are six emotions um, that we listed out earlier, which are all represented in the uh, letter Vav, because it equals the number six, like those six emotions. And it has that shape of taking something from the mental energy, which is hidden, like the Fasma and the Bina, to now be um, um, expressed in the feelings, which is those six attributes. Um and it, okay, we just said that the first significance of the Vav is its numerical value, which is six. This hints to the fact that emotional energies represented by the letters by this letter are six in number. 
these are the six divine emotional attributes mentioned in the verse. So this is a verse that we say actually every day in our daily prayer. Yours, God, are Gedula, Givura, Tiferes, Netzach, and Hod, for all, which is Bakol, that is in the heaven and earth. The energies which God possesses, they are yours, are Gedula, another frame of Chesed. Gedula is greatness, which is referring to the kindness and chesed. You have gevura, which is that discipline. You have teferis, which is that compassion and beauty. Netzach, which is endurance, and hod, which is gratitude. Sorry, and which is gratitude and splendor. And then you have the last one, which is bakol for all, is the yesod, which is connection, the sixth energy, which gathers all of the energies above and channels them below. The verse continues: Yours, God, is the kingdom. Hamelucha. The Tanya now clarifies that this refers to a different energy not included within with the previous six. The six energies of Vav are represented by the words in the verse until yours God is the kingdom. Up two, but not included, not including this phrase. Yours God is the kingdom refers to Malchus, which is control manifestation, which as we shall see is represented by the last letter of the Tetragrammaton, the second hate. Um, so just before we continue, I just want to show you all this in the scissor. I just want to quote it to you. It's a beautiful blessing um, that King David, after the sanctuary was moved to Jerusalem, um, and, um, and there were incredible blessings for the Jewish people, David knew that his days were numbered, so he wanted to bless all the Jewish people. So this is on page 35 of our Siddur. King David says the following. He gives a blessing to God. And then he says, these are the words of David. Uh, Blessed are you, Lord, God of our father Israel, in the in all the realms of the universe. So now David is going through the realms. He says, Lord, yours, meaning to you, is greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty, for all in the heaven and the earth. So that's six levels that the Tanya over here is, is, is quoting from this uh, section of the prayer book to say those are the six emotions that are connected in the Vav, uh, 35. And then the next verse, like there's a period, and then King David continues. Lord, yours is the kingship, and you are exalted. So now the Tanya is saying that that's a separate verse, and that's referring to a different uh, letter of God's name. That's going to be Malchus, which is the lowest of the ten sephiras, which is hinted to through the letter hey that we're about to explain. So I know all this is very esoteric. The point that we're trying to say is you have the four letters of God's holy name. That's a yud, a hey, a vav, and a hey. The ten sephiras, or divine energies of God, are represented to in those four letters. And also us, our soul powers, not ten soul powers, and those are also two alluded, those are also alluded in those four letters. The Yud is re representing the highest um, uh, of our soul powers, which is the ability to inquire and to get an idea. And it all starts from an idea. Inspiration in the heart has to come with an idea. You first get an idea, then you develop the idea. And once you anal analyze it and develop an idea, now you could express the idea. So when a person is acting kind and generous, it didn't start in the heart. It starts in the mind. And he develops it. And how does he implement it? Through his feelings and through his action. So the Yud is representing the Chachma within our, the, within our soul powers. The He is representing the development of that idea, which is alluded to in the He, which is expanded. That's the Bina, expanding an idea, developing an idea putting more of a form to it. And then you have the Vav, which is the next letter of God's name, which is um, uh, um, bringing the ideas from a mental or hidden state to more of a revealed state. We all know that a person, you could tell someone else's energy, even if they're not talking. Just from looking in their eyes and seeing their body movements, you could already get a feel of their idea, of, of their feelings. So that's the feelings within us. Even before communicating it through words and speech, you could already get an idea of a person's feelings. So that's alluded to in the Vav, 
which are the six emotions that follow the, the mental uh, capacity. Then what we're about to explain is the last letter, hey, of God's name is going to be alluded to in um, uh, in, in Malchus. Malchus is God's kingship, and we're going to exp explain all of it. The point of what we're trying to bring out of all of this is that when we sin, we're making a fragmentation in God's holy name. And therefore, teshuva has to be re to return the hey, which is the, the part of God's name that is the most affected by our sin. That's going to be an idea that we're trying to bring out, but the Alter Rebbe is, is explaining it so beautifully uh, by way of, of uh, these sephiras, divine powers, and how it is also in our soul or soul powers. Um, uh, yes, Naomi, you have a question. Go for it. So which so, hay are we restoring when we do shuva? Oh, good question. Both. Oh. There's two hays, and therefore there's going to be two levels of teshuva. There's going to be a lower teshuva, which is restoring the lower hay. And then there's also going to be a higher teshuva, which is restoring the higher hay. What's what's the difference between those two teshuvas? Good question. So the lower hay is a revealed, it's it's more on the revealed world. <clears throat> Just like um, in the four letters, we were saying the first two letters, the Yud and the Hey, is all within the hidden world. It's within our mind. It's still not communicated or expressed. So also within God, the Hey, which is representing the Bina of God, is still within a hidden world. The lower Hey is more within expression and, and emotions, and that's already within the revealed world. When we do a sin, there's... Um, a and when we do teshuva, there's a reparation that has to happen in the revealed world of our sin, but also within the hidden world. So there's two. There's going to be two layers to our teshuva based on the two layers, the two letters. Hey. So, All right. So, so if I was going to uh, look for an example of, in, you know, how do we apply that? Does that mean that let's say we sinned against somebody, and if we uh, apologize or make restitution. That's the lower hay. But if we're talking to God and re or resolving to do it differently next time, is that the higher hay? I think even that's a good that's a good point. I think within a sin to another person and within a sin to God, you could you could do the chuva on a on a surface level, which is more on a revealed level, or you could do teshuva on a deeper hidden level. Um, so even when you apologize with speech, there's a much deeper place that you could come, you could show up to in your teshuva, um, that's, that's beyond the surface. Um, so there's within each one, you could do teshuva on a surface level, which is returning the lower hay of God's name and a deeper level, which as, as we go further, hopefully it'll become clearer what the deeper level is, what's the more surface level, what's the reveal level, what's the hidden level. I'm hoping it'll become clearer, but I'll also look at my notes from a couple weeks ago to see if I, I don't think I gave an example on it, but I'll, 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 I'll try to double check. Uh, yes, Jerry, you had a question? Yeah, thank you. Oh, no. no. Okay. I'm just going to make a comment. That yeah, the, sure. The big hey is, um, is God's light and the lower hey is how he speaks to us, how he takes the light and and, and communicates with yeah. us. Very nice. Okay, awesome. That's all. That's all. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, let's see further. Uh, also, just look at my battery life over here. Yeah, we should be good. All right, awesome. Yeah, you have light. <laughs> exactly. So the six emotional energies. Oh, no, I don't think I read the uh, higher paragraph. Yours, God, is the kingdom refers to God's attribute of Malchus, which is not considered one of the six emotional attributes of God. Rather, it is called God's word. As the verse states, for king's word is power. So in that verse, it puts together king and word. So Malchus, which is kingship, God's kingship, is represented to in words. Um, the way we could understand that, the way we could understand that is, um, I guess we'll have to analyze that a little bit. Besides for that verse, how would I communicate the idea that a king has his power through words? I think I because know. a king's command know. is what 
you know, it's like the law of the Medes and Persians could not be changed. Mm. So it goes out and it has authority or power. Yeah, through his speech. I mean, the reason why I'm struggling to explain it is in my understanding, King, even if he's quiet, he instills fear in the people around him. Just his presence. Um, so that's beyond speech. Somehow the kingship is going to be associated with a speech, like exactly like you're saying, Lynn, like through his command, through his words, that's where the king rises above everyone else. I was also thinking that the king was required to carry a Torah with him yeah. and teach the people. Right. The Torah coming from the mouth. Through the mouth. King. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, somehow, like between the two of exactly where, like what you're saying, there's that connection or association between Malthus, kingship, and the speech, communication coming from the mouth. Um, and if you think of King David, which was the great king, so much of what we know of King David came through his lips, came through his song, came through his speech. Um, in the book of Psalms. Um, so I may, maybe he'll explain it. Let's see a little further. The six emotional energies represented by the Vav remain inwardly experienced feelings. They are outwardly directed. They are feelings about something or somebody else, but they are not yet actually expressed. Malchus, on the other hand, is the power of actual manifestation. It is the only divine energy which is a direct influence on the universe. That is why it is compared to sovereign power, which directly controls a country. Malchus is also symbolized by speech, tool of influence. That follows after internal processing through intellect and emotion. I love that. So, so just to, to explain this idea, Malchus, which is kingship, is the idea of actual manifestation. Even the other six emotions, while they're outwardly directed, they all remain within you. The feeling of kindness is in me. Um, Malchus is how it's being now directed outside. So if I'm understanding that correctly, all of the higher, all of the higher nine levels, if you wrote, they all have their gateway outward through Malchus. It's such an incredible idea. If a person wants to be kind, it's through chesed, but it has to act through malchus. The outward expression is coming through from malchus, acting on behalf of chesed. Just like sovereign power, um, it directly controls a country. So a person acting outside of themselves is happening through malchus. And therefore, a tool of influence, which is speech, is what's alluded to in, by malchus. Malchus is represented by the final hay of the Tetragrammaton and hinted to by the shape of the hay as follows. In order to explain the metaphor of Malchus as divine speech, the Tanya will first review the physiology of human speech as described in Jewish mystical sources. The source of speech inside the body is the breath that rises from the thoracic cavity. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Thoracic cavity around the heart. So that's where the breath comes from. I guess when you take a deep breath, it's coming from beyond the throat. It's coming from the heart. It's coming from the chest. And that breath is then divided by the five organs of speech, which is the throat, the palate, the tongue, the teeth, and lips into various letters. So it starts from the breath that rises from the, cavity, the, thoracic, the thoracic cavity of the heart. And then it divides itself into five organs of speech, which is the throat, palate, tongue, speech, and lips. So that's a total of five. So that's going to be alluded to in the five, um, uh, the letter hey, which is the number five, equals the number five of the Tetragrammaton of God's holy name. So the letters Aleph, oh, so this is beautiful. The letters Aleph, so now we're going to go through all 22 letters. Which of the 22 letters come from which of the five organs? Um, I don't know if he's going to go through all of them, but let's see. He's going to go through most of them. The letters Aleph, Tess, Hay, and Ayin are formed by the throat. Right? If you try to pronounce the letter Ch, it's going to come from the throat more than the tongue or the teeth. If you try to pronounce the letter Ayin, and uh, actually Israelis are much better at pronouncing an Ayin, 
the ayin actually has to come from the throat, not from the mouth. Ayin. It comes from the throat. The letters bet, vav, mem, and pe. Try to say the letter mem. It's coming from the lips. The letters zayin, sama, tzadik, chin, were formed by the teeth. So most of those I got, shin, I'm having trouble seeing from the teeth. Shin, for me, it seems like it's coming from my tongue, but the Tanya is saying from the teeth. And the letters dalid, pes, lamid, nun, and taf. So all those I get, those are formed through by the tongue. And the letters gimel, yud, taf, and kuf are formed by the palate. So it's from the, the zohar, and it's just incredible how there's five organs and now all the 22 Hebrew letters are coming from one of these five organs. The letter He, whose numerical value is five, is therefore, uh, therefore hints to speech, since speech is produced by five organs. By the way, was He one of the, was He included in any of these letters? I don't think so. Hey. The top one. The, the, thro the throat. Oh, thank you. Yes. Hay is from the throat. Awesome. Hay is from the throat. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Shira. Okay. So, Hay is alluding to speech since speech is produced by these five organs. So, that's very well expressed. The letter Hay has a further connection with speech since it is a letter produced from pure breath without any organ or of speech. As stated in the liturgic, liturgical poem, Kadmus, we say that on Shavuot, and it says like this, that the hey is a light letter that has no substance. So hey is just that breath. Ha. Hey, like the letter H in English, is produced from breath alone. It therefore is a direct expression of the source of speech inside the body, the breath that rises from the thoracic cavity around the heart. For these reasons, the last letter of the Tetragrammaton, A, hints to divine speech, which is Malchus, as the number He hints to the five organs of speech, and as the letter, it hints to the breath which powers that speech. Obviously, God does not have a physical body, so how are we to understand this very physical analogy of breath, thoracic cavity, and speech organs in reference to God? And we'll end with this idea. Um, so we're going a little bit over time, but let's just try to get through this idea. And the answer is as follows. And while God has no semblance of a body, God forbid, nevertheless, the Torah speaks of God in human terms, employing these metaphors to teach us about spiritual energies that resemble in some subtle way the role of these physical forms. Metaphorically, even God's word, Malchus, also has 22 letters that are divided by five divine organs of the articulation, though, uh, sorry, through which every form was created. In Kabbalah and Hasidus, the physical description of God re refer to real spiritual phenomena. God's speech and even speech organs describe the energy of Malchus, which has a similar role to human speech, that of outward manifestation as was explained in Tanya Part 2, Chapter 11, in the discussion of these divine letters. So this is going to just be a quote. All forms of energy and power which flow from the divine attributes to the lower world to create them something from nothing to energize them and sustain them are called sacred letters. The channels of energy which flow from God's will, intellect, and emotions to create the world and energize them. Now the divine letters are 22 different channels of energy flow powers that differ from one another, and through them all the worlds were created, upper and lower, as well as all the creatures within them. For it arose in God's will and wisdom to create the world with exactly 22 types of energetic flow, no more and no less. Let's conclude with a practical lesson. On page 73, we'll give a quick summary. Oh, 73, and then there's another one on 74. The four letters of the Tetragrammaton represent the flow of energy in the divine realm, which is mirrored by the flow of intellect and emotions in your soul. And finally, practice lesson on 74, when the Torah uses the metaphor of speech in reference to God, 
it means his power of manifestation. So that's awesome. When it says God speaks, God obviously doesn't have a physical body to speak. It's referring to, to God's uh, power of manifestation, to reveal, to express, which is Max. The letters of God's speech are packets of energy which power the universe. So I love that. And that's actually what we just quoted from um, uh, chapter 11 of Shari Yichid Vamuna, the section of book two, that the letters are packets of energy that God uses to, to power the universe. So anyway, the point over here will be that the four letters of God's name are hinting to the four, to uh, the root of our soul that has that comprises of ten soul powers that we could see in the shape of the letter and in in in, in certain instances in the number of each of the letters. Like the yud is the smallest letter is referring to our ability of, to inquire, and the thorn above the yud is referring to our our ability to have that will that is beyond any form, and that drives everything from our intellectual from our emotional and and, and our action our practical um, and the same with other letters like the last letter the hey has is representing our ability it's, it's representing malchus which is our ability to express the outside which is uh, powered in the ability of speech which comes from the five different organs of our body of our of our of our mouth uh, that come from the deep breath of our of of our what was it, a thoracic? Thoracic. Thoracic, thank you. Thoracic uh, cavity of the heart. And from there it goes outward. Around. All right. Around. Oh, uh, around, around, around the heart. Around. Awesome. Around. We have nurses here that are experts. Um, okay, for those that have to go, we are a little over time. But for those that would like to stay, we'll answer all these questions on this incredibly Kabbalistic idea. Good.